Let's open them up. Old Testament, 2 Samuel chapter 21. I just want to encourage you guys, you know, know that, uh, know that, you know, as we study the word and we get into this, I was reading recently, I remember when we started the church, midweek services, this was about eight, eight, eight and a half years ago, midweek services in the body of Christ across the country were down to, I think, 13% of churches in America were having a midweek church service, right? I'm reading an update on that. At this moment, 3% of churches in America have a midweek service, and the Sunday service is 45 minutes or less. And the, the great desire behind it is to be appealing to the unsaved. And we're kind of, and it's kind of interesting to me because we're wondering what's happening. It's not that complicated. It's that God wrote a book, right? I'm no brain surgeon, but it takes a little time to study this thing and learn it. And that, that it's like Starbucks. If Starbucks starts selling uh, hamburgers, well, then there's no coffee, right? The purpose of our gatherings, guys, is the apostles' doctrine, prayer, the breaking of bread and fellowship. That's not Washington's job. That's not the school system's job. That's us. That's what we do, the church. So, yeah, I just encourage you guys and those especially here on Wednesday night, you know, I applaud you. This is what we do and we grow in it. I was talking to a, a Jewish man last week and he was educated. And, you know, he was like, I could never be a Christian. And I said, why? He says, I'm a Jewish and I says, well, you know, Jesus and the apostles were all Jewish. He says, no, that's, that's questionable. He said, no, it's not really questionable. He goes, well, that's debatable. I'll have to look into it. I was like, okay, go ahead, look into it. You know, Jesus, that's what we're dealing with. We're dealing with an age that has no clue what the Bible says, even what history teaches, to be honest. And that's why we come. We learn, we grow, and then all you got to do is go into your world and just, by the grace of God, lovingly just share what you know and uh, the Lord will use it. So that's what we're here for tonight. Second Samuel 21, we're making our way right through the Old Testament. And uh, if you're taking note tonight, the title to the message is God Still Judges Nations. God Still Judges Nations. And we're gonna see that tonight in Second Samuel 21. But before we dive in, let's set our hearts, we'll pray. We'll ask the Lord to bless our time in his word. Hmm. Father, I do tonight just thank you for my brothers, my sisters in Christ. And Lord, I pray tonight as your word goes forth that it would be something that exhorts, encourages, Lord, builds them up, brings correction where necessary. And Lord, causes us, Lord, to be, to be closely knit to what you are doing, to your mind, your heart, and your will in these last days, we pray. And we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Now we're in 2 Samuel 21. If you want with a sticky note or something, you can turn to Jeremiah 17 as well. We're gonna look at a couple different verses tonight. We're only gonna be looking, we're not gonna actually cover the whole chapter because I sense the Lord wants me to talk about this God judging nations. But we're looking at verses one through 14. And we've been moving through the book of 2 Samuel. We've seen in this book, the triumphs and the troubles of King David. You know, David is a man after God's own heart. It's a fact. It's true. God loved David. You know, I know sometimes people say God has no favorites, but, you know, it's kind of one of those things where the disciples that, that kind of stick to, to Jesus' leg and just grab on like a child and say, you know, Daddy, I want to just want to ride. They just tend to be the ones that are around the king the most. And that's how David was. He just stuck to the Lord through his triumphs and through his troubles. And we saw in this book, as I shared last week, and we've been studying through it, one of my favorite things about the Bible is God does not sugarcoat the failures of, of even the greatest heroes of the Bible. You know, King David gets more press than anyone else in scripture other than Jesus himself. Other than Jesus, the Bible talks more about David than any other character, any other person. But it doesn't sugarcoat his, his failures. And in uh, 2 Samuel chapter 11, we saw the beginning of David really failing. You know, his fall with Bathsheba, it starts in 2 Samuel 11 verse 1. It says, in the time when kings go off to war, what did David do? It says, he pulled the lever on his lazy boy recliner and turned on the tube. Well, not exactly. That's the message Bible. But, uh, you know, that's what happened. It was lethargy. If you're taking note, jot it down. Lethargy, however you want to pronounce it. 
David just kind of said, it's time for me to kick back. It's time for me to no longer be a part of the battle, be a part of the kingdom, what God's doing. And that's always a mistake, brother and sister in Christ. It's always a mistake. It's always a mistake. The best place to be is right in the thick of things, man. Right there. It's the safest place. And you want to know what else? It's the most restful place to be. It's the most restful. People think if I just tap out for a season and don't engage in the battle, I'll get rest. That is the biggest lie ever in Christianity. You will have more problems than you could, you could dream of. And David did that and problems came. You know, and I, I, I have in quotations in my notes, I don't feel like it. I think David kind of said, I don't feel like it. Don't, don't, don't do that. <laughs> you, know, you want to stay the course. You want to do what God's word has to say. And we're watching as David, you know, through that sin with Bathsheba, we see discipline, we see consequence. We see his son Amnon end up raping his half-sister Tamar. David is still lethargic. He's still kind of in a spiritual funk. He doesn't deal with that. Then Absalom raises up, ends up killing his brother Amnon. And then it goes on. Absalom rebels against David. The rebellion gets struck down because God still, you know, he still has his hand and his anointing upon David. The calling and giftings of God are without repentance. And now we've seen David restored. He's back in the kingdom. He's back in Jerusalem. But now in chapter 21, we're going to see as things have settled down, right? As God has brought about almost a spiritual restoration to Israel and to David's life, God still is going to do some business when it comes to the nation of Israel. And I think this is a very important message tonight for us to understand for where we're at it, Tonight, 2019, you know, we're coming to the end of the year, the beginning, the first Sunday in January, I'll do a prophecy message where we'll talk about this a little more. But tonight in the United States of America, I think we need to understand that, that God still judges nations. He always has, and he always will until the kingdom comes. A couple of verses, if you're taking note, jot it down. Psalm 33 Psalm 33, verse 12, it says, happy is the nation whose God is the Lord. You know, when a nation puts God first, there's joy, there's a blessedness, there's a happiness. Jeremiah chapter six, verse 16, the prophet Jeremiah speaking to the nation of Israel, Jeremiah six, verse 16, he says this, thus says the Lord, stand in the way and see and ask for the old paths where the good way is and walk in it then you will find rest for your souls. But in Israel, it says, but they said, we will not walk in it. You know, tonight we're gonna look at this idea in scripture of God judging nations, and he's gonna do this in the nation of Israel. And we'll see how he does that still in the world today. He's done it throughout human history. So let's pick it up. Second Samuel chapter 21, we'll pick it up in verse one. It says, now... There was a famine in the days of David. It says for three years, year after year, and look at this, and David inquired of the Lord and the Lord answered. And he said this, look it, note this. It is because of Saul and his bloodthirsty house because he killed the Gibeonites. Now, if you're taking note tonight, uh, number one, in terms of God still judges nations and a as a nation, you know, we, we're, we're citizens of a nation. You know, we have, uh, you, know, you know, we live in the United States of America. <laughs> as a nation, how do we bring about transformation? You know, one of the words the church likes to use is revival. What does that actually look like biblically? We're gonna kind of look at some of these things tonight as we go through chapter 21. But number one, in terms of God still judges a nation and and what can we do to be a part of seeing God bring about spiritual revival here and holding off the judgment of God? Number one is we need to quickly seek the Lord. We need to learn to quickly seek the Lord in everything in life. You know, I love it being a dad because uh, my kids, you know, they'll, they'll, when they were really young, they would be really quick to ask for my help. You know, how, many, how many dads? A couple dads here? Some dads? Yeah. So you remember when your kids were really young? and they needed something, they would ask for your help quickly. You see, that's how the new believers are here. Now, what happens is as the kids get older, you know what happens? They wait longer to ask for my help. And then usually, you know what that means? They need my help even more by the time I get there. You know why? Because they messed it up so bad. I got to fix the whole thing, right? 
You, that's how we are spiritually. We really are. You know, we were like, oh, I'm so mature. Usually that means that we're better at messing things up sometimes, you know. We're like, no, 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 Lord, I got this. I got this. He's watching us just hack away at it. You know, he's like, oh, yeah, that's wonderful. You know, yeah, the screw goes right there, you know. It's just interesting. You know, that's what happened here with David. If you have your pen underlined, it says there was a famine in the days of David for three years. Now, I imagine the first year there's this famine, and they chalked it up maybe to natural phenomena, right? It's uh, global warming, Right? Maybe they did a study on that. It was global warming, uh, maybe other factors. But now the second year, David's starting to go, I don't know. You know, this is kind of weird. By the third year, David realized, wait a second. I think I need to pray about this, you know. I think I need to pray. You know, I, I find it interesting in our nation, we have these famine-like conditions. Maybe not food, but we have a famine. We have a famine of peace in this land. We have a famine of love in this land. We have a famine of just, you know, a lack of fear, people feeling safe. It's unbelievable. And, and we kind of like do these different studies, but may, maybe it's that we need to seek the Lord. Maybe we need to ask the Lord what it is. You know, it kind of shocked me that it took David three years to finally get before the Lord and pray about this and say, Lord, we have no food. <laughs> You know, maybe it was because there was so much stored up that he didn't feel the effects until they began to run out of it. You know, sometimes we could be that rich in certain areas or feel like we're that rich. It's important we catch that. You know, how long does it take you to realize I need to seek the Lord? How long does it take you? You know, what has to happen in your and my life to get us to the place where we get on our knees and we say, Jesus, I need your help in this area. Lord, if you don't move in this area, you know, how long? What does the Lord have to do to get you to that place? For David, it took three years of famine. And, and in Israel, this was a national peril. This was serious. You know, I think this takes a special kind of stubbornness. If you're taking note, jot it down, Numbers 22, verse 22, 22 through 31 Great area of scripture. I encourage you to read it. It's there, a prophet. His name was Balaam. Can you guys say Balaam? Balaam. Balaam he gets called by uh, a leader of a nation named Balak to come and curse God's people. And as he was on the way, he's riding this donkey. And the Bible says the angel of the Lord is in the path. And the donkey keeps, the donkey sees the angel of the Lord. But the, but the great prophet or what have you, Balaam doesn't see. And he keeps, he keeps going off path and Balaam's beating this donkey, beating him. Because he's thinking that the problem is the donkey. Meanwhile, the donkey, he's so lucky the donkey didn't have, you know, five fingers here to grab the stick and hit him and go, you're the dummy. But he, he keeps going off path. Finally, the Bible says the angel of the Lord is in a pathway where he cannot get by, can't get by. And the donkey just lays down and he's beating it. And the Bible says, it's a great area of scripture. The Bible says God gives the donkey the ability to speak. So all of a sudden we're watching Shrek. The Bible all of a sudden turns into Shrek, you know. It's really. And he starts talking. And the weirdest part about this area of scripture is Balaam hears the donkey. He doesn't like pass out. And it says then two hours later, Balaam woke up from, you know, passing out, you know, in shock. No, Balaam starts talking back to the donkey. Kind of interesting. But you know, how stubborn can we be? Human nature, we are so stubborn. We have the ability to be so stubborn. It's unbelievable. David, you know, when we read about these Bible characters, I would say to you, many of them are the best of us. They're the Olympians. They're the ones we send off to win the marathon. We couldn't, you know, we have trouble jogging around the neighborhood. But David, it took him three years, you know, so we have to realize this is part of us. This is a condition we have too. But it says David did inquire of the Lord and the Lord answered him. This word inquired, if you have your pen circle, it means to search out, to strive after. You know, many of us were searching out and striving after things. God's going, I will take care of that. What I'm asking you to do is inquire of me, to come to me, to seek me out. And can I tell you this? When you seek the Lord, God does answer. He meets us in that place. How many times have I finally gotten before the Lord and sought him on something. And I just sense my heavenly father just saying, <laughs> finally, I thought you'd never come. 
I was wondering how long you're going to try to take that donkey through that narrow place when I wanted to lift you up, and do something. And what you'll find when you seek him is that you'll find him. And this is the center of everything. Church, listen, this is the center of anything. This is one of my greatest fears in Christianity today that we don't realize. You know, it's good. We should be focusing on discipleship and growing, growing people in the Lord. But can I say this? If all we're doing is teaching people how to be Christianized, we're not doing anything. If we're just teaching them, this is what a Christian looks like. This is what Christian lingo sounds like. This is one of my favorite parts about being the pastor here is, man, you know, some of you guys, I look and go, Lord, by the blood of Jesus, that's the only way that guy's going to heaven, you know. But I love it. It it's, it's impacts people. But we're not to be teaching everybody how to be Christianized, to know Christian lingo, because if, but if you don't have a real relationship with him, who cares about the rest of it? Like, let me just pull the veil back. That's what this whole thing is about. It's about knowing Jesus. Like, if I didn't know Jesus, I don't, I don't know how people even want to live. If you don't walk with the Lord, that's the blessing. That's the whole blessing. It's not about theology or doctrine. The most, the most profound theology is a real life relationship with Jesus. I'm not saying you shouldn't study or know why you believe what you believe. You know, I've read so many books and I've studied theology, but it's not until I get in the presence of, the, of God and I take the theology that, it, that the Holy Spirit goes like this. He puts it together. And I go, oh, I see. And you know what I usually see as a person? His name is Jesus. He is the, he's the, the bulk of all this wisdom. And it's so true here. But David finally seeks the Lord. He prays. Now, I want you to see this here in verse 1, that when God answers David, it's so far from what David probably thought God was going to say. God says to him, <laughs> he says, it's because of Saul. It's his bloodthirsty house. It's because he killed the Gibeon, Gibeonites. You know, when we seek God, often the response we get from God's word is not what we were expecting. Now, I want to make this very clear. And this is just sound doctrine. We speak to God through prayer, but God speaks to us through what? It's his word. It's his word. Be so careful. So much of Christendom today is turning Christianity into like a shopping mall. And Christianity now, as we're, we're going through the mall, we're kind of strutting, you know, we got our Starbucks, you know, I like coffee, but it's not, it's not, you know what I mean? We're going through the mall with our Starbucks and we're kind of like picking, like, Lord, is this the, is this the ministry you want me to be? <laughs> and and I, I know it's very popular and so it's going to be offensive to some of you, but this is not Christianity. It's not how Christianity works. That, that type of Christianity doesn't actually exist in this book. I know it exists in many other books people are writing. It's not in this book. It doesn't exist. That, that's, not, that's not biblical Christianity. That's, that's 2019 Christianity. See, biblical Christianity doesn't work like that. God wants to work in us so that he can effectively work through us. And in essence, when God speaks to David, he basically says, this is my word to you. You're the king and you're not doing something right. You've missed something in your land. And I want it to change. I want it to change. And it's interesting how God does this. You know, the reason for this national judgment is because of Saul. You see, back in Joshua 9, for you no takers, shut it down. Joshua 9, God was giving Joshua this, they were just rolling through the promised land. God's blessing was on them. They had some pitfalls. Remember the story of AI, you know, little Achan had the sin under his tent. But God dealt with that. Joshua prayed, sought the Lord. But now they're rolling in this group called the Gibeonites. They were in Canaan. God had says, you're to bring judgment to all the tribes of Canaan. The tribes outside of Canaan, you don't have to touch them. But the tribes in Canaan, they have to be wiped out. They were killing their children. They were doing horrible things. And God's, God had given them so much time to repent. They did not repent. Now God was bringing judgment on those nations. Well, the Gibeonites, they get smart. They show up to Joshua and it's kind of like, you know, they were like Hollywood. They put on like old clothing and they, they got like, a, like their, their wine skin. They made it look like it was dried and they got there. And it, it's amazing when you read it because they're like, we baked bread when we left and now it's cold and moldy. And that's like the evidence that it's true. And they basically convinced Joshua they're from a far country. They just want a treaty with them. 
Joshua makes a covenant with them. He doesn't pray about it. He acts impulsively. You know, anybody who says they have discernment but acts impulsively, you know what that means? They don't have discernment. Because patience is a weapon that reveals deception. You know, when you're in the spirit, you're willing to be patient. When you're in the flesh, it's like, I, God told me to do this. And it's like, yeah, it looks like it. Yes, okay, of course. It doesn't work like that because the spirit of God, it's, it's, it's how he works. But Joshua moves on it. Now he makes a covenant with the Gibeonites. Next thing they know, Gibeonites leave. They discover, oh, the next city is the Gibeonites. They, they were tricked. But I want you to notice, God still honored that covenant. Saul later on, the Bible tells us here that Saul would go back in and slaughter them. And God was not pleased with that. He was not okay with it. He wasn't okay that they went back in and did this. And God told them that it was not acceptable and that there was now this judgment on the land of, of Israel. Now listen, I just want you to understand this. Since 1973, in the United States of America, Roe versus Wade, was it 50 million babies have been aborted, right? We're, we're such an inter we, we live in such an interesting time because everyone believes we've progressed so much and literally nothing has changed. You know the pre predominant reason why God sent Israel into Canaan to wipe out the people was because they were killing their children. A Molech, they would heat up Molech's hands and put their children on there Be because they would say, if we don't do this, we won't, they would do that so they would have prosperity. That's what they, that was the reason. It, it's so similar today. And there is still national judgment. There really truly is still national judgment. But let's move on. Let's see how God deals with that here in Israel. Let's move on. Verse two. It says, so the king called the Gibeonites and spoke to them. And he says, now the Gibeonites were not of the children of Israel, but the remnant of the Amorites, the children of Israel, uh, of the Amorites. The children of Israel had sworn protection to them, but Saul had sought to kill them in his zeal for the children of Israel and Judah. Now, we're looking at God still judges the nations. Number one was quickly seek the Lord. Like if, if as a nation we seek the Lord again, we will see things change in this nation. But number two, we need to be about pleasing God. We need to be about pleasing God. Here in verse two, you know, David goes to the Gibeonites and he talks to them about this. And it gives us an insight here. The Holy Spirit tells us at the end of verse two, but Saul had sought to kill them in his zeal for the children of Israel. You know, what motivated Saul to go in and slaughter the Gibeonites after Joshua had made a covenant with them? It was Saul's desire to please man. It was his desire. It was not in his zeal to God, but in his desire to please people. Can I say this? A people pleaser is never a good leader in the kingdom. You know, if your desire is to get a lot of people to like you, this Christian thing is never going to really take root. You know, that's one of the reasons I love being in New York is... Most of you guys don't really care too much what people think about you. You know, it's not, a, it's not a bad quality to have as a Christian. You know, a couple of verses to jot down, Jeremiah 17, verse 5 through 10, I told you earlier. You know, the Bible says, Cursed is the man who trusts in man, who makes flesh his strength, whose heart departs from the Lord. You know, you can either trust man. In that same area of Scripture, Jeremiah 17, you could trust man, then verse... Uh, <clears throat> Then he goes on, blesses the man who trusts in the Lord, whose hope is the Lord. It's amazing because what happens in this chapter is exactly what David does. He chooses to trust God. Verse eight, for he shall be like a tree planted by the waters, which spreads out its roots by the river and will not fear when heat comes, but his leaf will be green and will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will cease from yielding fruits. So you can either trust man, you can trust the Lord. Jeremiah 17, verse seven through eight or verse 9 through 10, or you can trust in your own heart, the Bible says. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? God says, I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind, even to give every man according to his wave, according to the fruit of his doings. And we see Saul doesn't trust in his own heart, but he trusts in man. David here is going to trust the Lord. He's going to trust the Lord. And it's so important if we need to be about pleasing God, especially in this age. A lot of what this book says in the current climate of the culture around us 
they're trying to, the culture's trying to turn it like God hates certain people. God doesn't love man. He loves everyone. But he tells them the truth because he loves them. And it's important we see that. Let's move on, verse three. So therefore, David said to the Gibeonites, so David's gonna deal with this now. He's not just gonna hear it from the Lord. He's not just gonna sing a song about it, but he's gonna do something about it. Therefore, David said to the Gibeonites, he says, what shall I do for you? And with what shall I make atonement? So David wants there to be a real step of reconciliation, that you may bless the inheritance of the Lord. Verse four, and the Gibeonites said to him, he says, we will have no silver or gold from Saul or from his house. So they said, we don't want your money. We're not looking for you to pay us, right? Nor shall you kill any man in Israel for us. Well, we'll see what happens with that. So he said, whatever you say, I will do for you. Then they answered the king and they said, as for the man who consumed us, and plotted against us that we should be destroyed from remaining in any of the territories of Israel. They're talking about Saul. Verse six, let seven men of his descendants be delivered to us and we will hang them before the Lord in Gibeah of Saul, whom the Lord chose. And the king said, I will give them. Now listen, this is a challenging thing. You know, when you read the Old Testament, this is where sometimes people get a little off when it comes to the Old Testament. It's because we kind of don't really understand what happened when Jesus Christ died for us on the cross. You know, one of the verses you could jot down, Exodus chapter 21, verse 23 through 25, the Old Testament law says, you know, if you shed man's blood, you know, you, your blood will be shed. Like that's how God dealt with sin. Uh, you know, when, when the Israelites sinned, they would have to bring an animal to the temple in Jerusalem and they would put their hand on the animal's head. They would confess their sin and the priest would slit the, the lamb's throat. You're going, that's messed up. No, 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 listen, sin is messed up. Sin has consequences. A lot of what we're seeing in the culture around us, they were going, oh, it's the, it's the parents or, oh, it's MTV. Well, they don't say that anymore, right? I'm, that's how disconnected I am. It's the music or it's the violent video games. No, no, no. The problem is something called, you ready? It's called sin. Sin's not bad because it's forbidden. It's forbidden because, you know why? It's bad. It hurts man. You know, when a young person takes in filth to their person, you know what happens? They do not get happier. <laughs> do you ever notice that? You know, you, you get a young person, they're like, if you don't give this to me, I'll, I'll run away. I don't know what your kids say. My kids don't say that. And don't you try, even try to because it won't work. But, but you know, they do this. So, so you finally give in. You give them what they want. Are they happier because of it? All of a sudden they come out of the house. Oh, I just feel such peace and joy. Mom, dad, I love you. That doesn't happen. What happens? Their eyes get dimmer. Their face gets paler. The, the life in them leaves. Why? Because sin is bad. <laughs> because God's word is true. Now listen, when Saul sinned and in his zeal for the Israelites went in and killed the Gibeonites, listen, it, God wasn't gonna deal with them in that moment as a nation, but God was gonna deal with them because sin is bad. The Bible says when one sparrow falls to the ground and dies, God attends that funeral, Right? God, God sees what's happening in our nation. He sees it. God sees what's happening. The Bible tells us in the Old Testament, God judged Egypt. God judged other nations. God still judges nations. Jesus is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He's still in charge, church. Jesus is in charge. He's in charge. And what happens in our culture is many people, just as they do with spirit-filled Christians, they take meekness for weakness. They think, oh, that brother, he forgives and he's humble. He's a weakling. No, he's the strongest of all of you is what he is, what she is. They take God's patience and forbearance as weakness, but he is not weak. And judgment does come. You see, Evidently, after this act of repentance, the rain will return 
And some scholars believe that these seven men, these grandsons of Saul, that these were actually a part of the murder of the Gibeonites. They were still alive. And because of that, God had brought judgment on the entire land. It hadn't been dealt with. You know, it hadn't been dealt with. That's why, church, listen, that's why as we partook of communion tonight, that's why communion is so important. Like, I believe there are two permissible sins that have grown and and cultivated their way into the body of Christ. I was talking to a, to a newer Christian in our church on Sunday after church about this. And she was asking me some questions. I says, there's two permissible sins. For some reason, we don't sing about these in, uh, in the Christian songs on the radio. You know, they're gossip and bitterness. These are the two sins that actually, if you do them, you actually might be more mature than others. But they're not. They're actually some of the most dangerous of all. They're the most dangerous. That's why communion is so important because it's at that place where we can just get rid of these things and confess our sin and say, Lord, this is what's happening in my heart. And we can be real with God. And it's so important that we are because God already sees these things. He sees them. So let's move on. Verse seven. So as the king says, I will give them, but look at this, verse seven, but the king spared Mephibosheth. Remember, Mephibosheth is Jonathan's uh, son, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, because of the Lord's oath that was between them, between David and Jonathan, the son of Saul. <clears throat> we didn't really make it that far there, but uh, stop there. Number three, if you're taking note in terms of God still judges nations, number three is learn and lean on God's promises. Learn and lean on God's promises. You need to learn the word of God, church. I, I know you're here on Wednesday, so I'm probably, you know, what is it, preaching to the choir. But you gotta learn the word. You gotta learn it. You know, there are promises of God. There are covenants. There are things that God says in his word. I will, I, I'm gonna do this. And you gotta believe him. Learn and lean on them. You know, the king, the Bible says here, David spares Mephibosheth. Now, Mephibosheth was a descendant of Saul. Mephibosheth could have been one that was selected to be hanged, but he wasn't. You know why? Because David had made a covenant with Mephibosheth's father, Jonathan. And the covenant that David made with Jonathan, listen, don't miss this, superseded the covenant that Saul, uh, the covenant that uh, Joshua had made with the Gibeonites and that Saul had broken. You know, that's the same that's happened with us. Listen, God will judge. He will judge the nations. Uh, the book of Revelation, God's gonna judge the world. This is what's gonna happen because God is a holy God. He's just. And there, there, there's wickedness. It just is what it is. It's amazing that we live in an age where if you ask somebody, and do it this week, ask somebody, you know, if you were to die, why? You know, you were to die and stand before God and he were to say, why should I let you into heaven? What would you say? Nine out of 10 people will say, you know what they'll say? Because I am a good person. You're going, what? <laughs> it's unbelievable. We live in the most sin-saturated time in the history of man, and everybody's a good person, apparently. You know, we got, you know, it's amazing. It's not gonna fly with the Lord. The Lord's, the Bible says he's gonna look and just his eyes are like flames of fire. It's gonna burn away all those excuses like this. And they're gonna be standing there going, you know, uh-oh, <laughs> what happened? I should have, should have bought the insurance. No, 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 you know, should have received Jesus. I need the Lord. You see, we have a promise too. There's a covenant that God has made with us that supersedes the judgment of God on our lives. And it is called the gospel. It's Jesus Christ dying for our sins. You could jot it down, Romans chapter eight, verses one through two. Paul describes it. He says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And he explains it because the law, the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set us free from the law of sin and death. You see, the law, the spirit of life in Christ Jesus actually is a, it supersedes that other, that other law, that the wages of sin is death. And each one of us here sins and we have sinned. And we deserve death. But God's grace supersedes that, just like it did in Mephibosheth's life. And he did not, he did not uh, fall into judgment. Well, let's move on, verse eight. So, so Mephibosheth is not one of those. And then we're gonna read to the end of verse 14. So the king took Armani. Uh, I'm not sure if it's the designer here. No, no, it's before time. And Mephibosheth, the two sons of Rispa, the daughter of Aya, whom she bore to Saul, and look at this, the five sons of Michael, the daughter of Saul, 
whom she brought up for Adriel. Now, for you guys that are a little cynical and are going, Michael didn't treat David right in the marriage, so now he's picked, I think I'm going to pick your five boys to go to see old good Gibeonite. That's not how it worked. Uh, if you're taking note, you could jot it down. 2 Samuel 6, 23. The Bible tells us Michael had no more children, but she had a sister whose name was uh, uh, Merab, I believe her name was. And uh, it says it there that she brought up for Adriel. You know, she, she brought them up. These were not her uh, biological children. Uh, so she, whom she brought up for Adriel, the son of Barzillai, the Maholite. And he delivered them into the hands of the Gibeonites and they, they hanged them on the hill before the Lord. So they fell all seven together and were put to death in the days of harvest, in the first days, in the beginning of barley harvest. Verse 10, now Rispa, the daughter of Aya, took sackcloth and spread it for herself on the rock from the beginning of harvest until the late, late rains poured on them from, from heaven. So this is from April to October, this woman mourned in sackcloth because it's sad. Death is always sad. Uh, and she did not allow, the Bible says, the birds of the air to rest on them by day, nor the beasts of the field by night. And David was told what Rispa, the daughter of Aya, the concubine of Saul, had done. Then David went and took the bones of Saul and the bones of Jonathan, his son, from the men of Jabesh Gilead, who had stolen them from the street of Beth Shan, where the Philistines had hung them up, after the Philistines had struck down Saul and Gilboa. Verse 13, so he brought up the bones of Saul and the bones of Jonathan, his son, from there. And they gathered the bones of those who had been hanged. They buried the bones of Saul and Jonathan, his son, in the country of Benjamin and Zela, in the tomb of Kish, his father. So they performed all that the king commanded. And look at this, if you have your pen, underline it. And after that, God heeded the prayer for the land. After that, God heeded the prayer for the land. I believe this is prophetic for the United States of America right now this moment this moment listen church god still judges nations and i'm going to say something it's not going to make everybody feel all warm and fuzzy inside but i'm going to tell you the truth because that's what i do that's what i'm called to do the united states of america is under god's judgment it's not it's a fact because of what we've done you might go i didn't do it it doesn't work like that <laughs> Isaiah, jot it down. Isaiah 1 through 5. Isaiah went around. They do this, and they do that, and then they do this, and they're the worst at that. And I picture Isaiah kind of with a street sign marching around the White House, you know, going, they do this, with the thing, the sign. But then the Bible says in Isaiah 6 that Isaiah saw the Lord. He saw the Lord. And then Isaiah began to weep. And he says, he says, Lord, I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Isaiah began to realize, <laughs> I have to repent of what my countrymen have taken part in. See, if you're taking notice, number four, God still judges the nations. And this is the deal. This is the key. I believe this is prophetic for the United States of America today. Is it, it, number four is real repentance is the key. Real repentance is the key. Real repentance, real repentance. You know, even in some of these things that we read, it's so tough to put it together. As I studied this area, I was going, oh my goodness, I'm looking so forward to talk about how they got to hang seven Israelites in Gibeon, you know. Lord, what do you have here? And sometimes the Lord has the most, the most, the most powerful words, I believe, in these areas. You know, God's ways truly are not our ways. You know, I, we're almost done here, but I just want to touch on a few verses. I want you to see this. I don't want you to miss this. Genesis chapter 18, verse 25. You know, there are throughout the Bible pictures of God judging nations. Genesis 18, God is about to go in and judge Sodom and Gomorrah. And, and Abraham is interceding for them. See, that's what God's people do. We don't protest, we pray. That's what, that's what changes things. Now, sometimes you pray and people don't change, but you pray nevertheless. And in Genesis 18, it looks like Abraham's having like a, you know, what are they, uh, an auction with God. He's like, if there's 50 or 50 righteous, 50 righteous in Sodom, then God's like, sure, I won't judge him 50. Uh, 40 righteous, 40 righteous, 40 righteous, 40 righteous. God's like, sure, okay, 30 righteous, 30 righteous. If there's five people, five people in the whole nation, there was, there was Lot and his family. That was it. But Genesis 18, 25, 
It's, it's amazing what, what he says here. He says, far be it from you to do such a thing as this. Abraham says to God, to slay the righteous with the wicked so that the righteous should be as the wicked, far be it from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Listen, we love God because of his love for us and his grace, and he is. But God is also just. He is righteous. There's divine justice. And there's great mercy. There is great mercy. In Israel, in the study we just looked at tonight, seven men dealt with the sin of Saul's house. And, and it, was, there was, it was over. You know, God's judgment was off of the land of Israel. You know, I don't, I don't know what will satisfy the Lord, but I can tell you this. Since, was it 1973, we have aborted 50 million babies. I'm telling you, if God is good, then God is just. It's what it is. So what are we to do? You know, the Bible says here that God heeded the prayer for the land. They, there had to be real repentance for God once again to heed it. I see, I see we're like doing all this stuff, right, to get God's attention, to bring revival, right? But that's not what revival looks like in the Bible. Revival looks like real repentance, it's the guy who says, oh, I love Jesus. He changed my life. And they keeps doing the exact same thing. It's not real repentance. You know, I love that person and it's okay. I'll bear with you. But it doesn't mean that the blessings of God are going to start flowing into your life. There has to be real repentance. It's just the biblical model. You know, 2 Kings chapter 22, jot it down. I'm just giving you a couple of illustrations from the Old Testament. I could do, I won't keep going. But I could, I could. There's so many illustrations of this. This shouldn't be that hard for the church of Jesus Christ today to understand this because it's what the Bible teaches. 2 Kings 22, Josiah becomes the king. He's a young boy. He's, in our church, he'd be back in the children's ministry. Now he's the king of Israel, right? But under his reign, one of the men discovers the book of the law. The word of God, this, this could never happen in the church today, right? The word of God was not in the church anymore. It wasn't there. Hmm, big shocker. They found it. One of them had found it. He read it. This is what real repentance looks like. He read it. Then he went, you know, rut row. Okay, we got a problem. <laughs> what he did was he looked around. He, he read the book. You know, some of you guys are like brand new Christians and you're reading and you're going, I've been to church before. They don't do none of this stuff. Uh-oh, right? He read it. Then he went to the king. He said, King, David, or king Josiah, we're not doing none of this. Josiah didn't say, get out of my face. I don't want to hear it. He didn't do that. The Bible says he rent his garments. He repented. He read it himself. And you know what happened? They changed what they were doing. They repented. They did it God's way. You see, this is one of the great challenges of this day is we have the body of Christ like coming up with all these ideas of stuff to do for God. Meanwhile, like people aren't stopping long enough to read the Bible and find out what God already told them to do. Like he already actually gave us instruction. Repentance, listen, if we wanna see the judgment of God withheld from this nation, it is going to start with the church of Jesus Christ. It's gonna start with us. We have to just grow in this. We have to pray. That's what happened. And one of the most well-known verses in all the Bible when it regards to this, jot it down. I want you to meditate on these things. I believe this message is, is prophetic. I really do. I believe God wants to speak to us as a nation and as a people and a part of this nation. Second Chronicles 7, 14. It's a verse that's quoted often, but I think we miss it. God was saying the same thing now to Solomon. He says, if my people, Solomon, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear, hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. It's where it happens. It's always been there. God's always at the end of the day brought about brokenness in a people, humility, then he's caused them to rediscover the word of God, the real word of God, not the, you know, the, the my cereal letters lined up in the cereal bowl were to God, but the actual Bible. When you get the actual Bible, you end up like Isaiah in chapter six, not Isaiah in chapter one through five. You're not out there pointing fingers. You're out there 
with brokenness in your heart saying, I am a man, I am a woman of unclean lips, and Lord, I'm asking you to forgive. Forgive us, Lord. Forgive us, Lord. And tonight I would challenge you as brothers and sisters in Christ, listen. You know, it's an exciting time of the year. We get to share the gospel. As a church here at Calvary, we, we teach the Bible. We're in the word. We're people of the book. We're desiring to do that, and we should continue to. But as we do, I think there's some things we need to realize. Number one, as a nation, we are under judgment. We're under judgment. It's not for what we're going to do. It's, it's like David. David had nothing to do with it. You might say, but pastor, I had nothing to do with it doesn't matter. David had nothing to do with it, but he still had to take responsibility for it. We have to take responsibility for that. We have to realize we stand before a holy God, and as a nation, we've, we've not only aborted 50 million babies, and there's a lot more we could go into. I'm just trying to keep us on one track here. But we've also spread it around the world. God sees that. But we have to take responsibility for that and say, Lord, the blood of Jesus You know, I thank God every time I pray about this, I always say, Lord, but thank you so much that every baby that was aborted, Lord, the kingdom of God belongs to the children, the Bible says, right? Those little ones are with the Lord. And Lord, have mercy on us. Forgive us, forgive those moms and those dads who've done that. Lord, forgive us, open their eyes to how good you are, that you've been so merciful and gracious. And as a people, church, listen, we need to pray, Lord, Just show people Jesus. Help people, Lord, to see Jesus. Help them to see you, Lord. Help them to humble themselves before you. We need that today more than ever before. Not man to proclaim to God what he's going to do for them. That is the wrong posture before a holy God, a just God, who has not given us what we deserved, but has shown us great mercy. As individuals, as families here, but also as a nation, And we should come to him with a humble heart and say, Lord, I'm a man of unclean lips and I live amongst the people of unclean lips, Lord. Forgive us. Forgive us. Heal our land. And church, listen, you be a part of that. Be a part of seeking God's face. Be a part of it. You know, if you say, man, I want my friend, my neighbor, my coworker, you know, my mom, my dad, my wife, my sister, my brother, my kids to know Christ. Listen, listen, you got to show them Christ. you got to walk with the Lord. you you got to do what you're supposed to do. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then. That's our part, right? We do that. And I, I want to tell you, you're going, wow, that's a heavy Wednesday night message. It's the word, you know, it's the Bible. But I just want to tell you, the, give you the icing at the end, right? I believe that God wants to move so desperately in this nation. I believe God wants to move so desperately amongst us in our body. And, and, and I believe the, the ingredients are there. Just like we saw with Josiah, we saw it in Solomon's day. It's the word of God. It's prayer. It's seeking the Lord, crying out to God. It's fellowship, learning to love one another, right? And it's that breaking of bread, coming back to the cross and realizing, Lord, we are under judgment. But Lord, we are so thankful that judgment was meted out on Jesus Christ on the cross for all of us, right? That judgment was poured out. And as a nation, I do believe there could be a revival if we would come to remember who Jesus is and recognize him as Lord and Savior and as the one who died for all of our sins. He took the consequence so that we don't have to hang like those seven men He took our consequence. He took your consequence. We need to thank him for it. Amen? Amen.